Welcome to the Thriving Minds Podcast with your host, Walter Parada, where we strive to provide you with empowering talks so you can live to thrive. I hope you find yourself in the right frame of mind, focusing on the things within your control. All right, so we have a very special episode today, and we'll be talking about Margaret Rudkin and how she built Pepperidge Farm. So Margaret Rudkin had three sons, and her youngest one had an allergy problem. So she was searching for foods that tailored to his needs. And this was in the 1930s, 1936 around there. She was unable to find foods that fit his diet. So eventually she just created her own, experimenting with different bread recipes that would not trigger his allergies. They had a family doctor that would come in and check on the son to see how he was doing. And prior to her making the bread that fit his needs, he was not progressing well in terms of health. The doctor recommended that the son be on a very strict diet of minimally processed foods, eating fruits and vegetables, but that wasn't enough to make significant improvements. After he was regularly eating the homemade bread that Margaret made, which was out of stone ground whole wheat bread that contained all of its vitamins and nutrients, the doctor then saw significant improvement in his health and asked what changed. And Margaret told him it was the bread that she made. So he tried it and he found it very tasty. This was in 1936. So at the time, commercially available bread was mostly processed that was bleached, known as white bread. So a lot of its essential nutrients and vitamins were stripped out of it. Before she created that bread recipe to fit her son's needs, there were many people that doubted that nutritious bread can be made that would also be delicious including her doctor. But this just emphasized the importance of the belief that you have within yourself to make your vision or idea come to life and really being committed to it. It's not so much important what others think because they're the ones not doing the work, but what is vital is you figuring out the potential or what can be done. And that's exactly what Margaret did. She tuned out the naysayers and focused on what she can control. Part of what makes this story so remarkable is that she had no baking experience prior to this. It started off as a necessity to meet her son's dietary needs. And she figured out a way by just trying and doing and coming up short to eventually find what suited him. So back in 1936, really the information that was available was through books and asking other people that have baked before. It's not like what we have today. With just a few words, we can search different things on the internet that provides us information to get us going. Her willingness to just try and not worry about not having experience. Too many times that mental block of, I don't know how to do something, prevents us from even trying. But we all have to start somewhere. Remember, we all sucked at what we did. At some point, we're all bad or terrible. And things just didn't come together. For Margaret... She had a reason other than herself to consistently figure out how to do this. It was her son's health that drove her to figure out how to make it happen. And having a reason bigger than yourself is such a powerful force because those times you don't feel like doing it, you're reminded that it's more than just you. It's going to be beneficial to others. Where just being self-serving, you might tend to take a day off here and there. And instead, you'll be more inclined to say, you know what? I got to put my want aside for the betterment of others that need me. Her commitment to quality ingredients and products allowed her to create a very successful business. As she was figuring out that winning recipe, her first loaf of bread was hard as a rock and about an inch thick, but she consistently tried different things to eventually find the recipe that's used today. This takes putting up with a lot of disappointment, but being able to evaluate things in an objective way to see the good and the bad of how things can be improved as opposed to just being dominated by emotions because in times of coming up short the tendency is to to feel down and this is just such a great lesson in whatever we do when we come up short it's natural to feel down but find a way to really self-assess where you can put some room in between yourself and the outcome Where instead of the default mode being negative, coming off saying, I'm not good enough, the focus should be, 
what's wrong, how did it go wrong, and how can it be improved. It's also important to find what went right because you can build on that as opposed to just starting over completely. This builds you up instead of tearing you down where you can fuel that belief within yourself. That is that positive momentum that can be built on. This grows your confidence that it can be done and will give more effort in the process going forward. Essentially what it comes down to is you get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit more better to where eventually that all adds up that makes a huge difference in where you were to where you are now. Margaret understood that there was a big need for the bread that she came up with and what helped her business get off the ground was the doctor asking her if she can bake that same bread for his other patients that had similar issues and she agreed. In the beginning she was doing all of this out of her home kitchen and back then she was a one woman show. She then decided to sell her bread to the local grocers trying to convince them that people were going to buy it but they were reluctant to do so. She was able to convince them by just giving them a taste of her bread and that sealed the deal. Sometimes words are not enough to really get people on board but they have to use one of their senses to really experience it. Margaret provided a high quality bread which separated herself from all the other commercially available white breads that were on the market. Instead of just being dictated by what the grocers wanted, she set a high standard of her bread to be sold at 25 cents a loaf when other commercially available breads were sold for 10 cents a loaf. So it was 150% premium as opposed to what was available. This might make a lot of people hesitate to see such a big price disparity between the two products, but when people actually give it a try and taste the higher quality, many people eventually are going to pay for it. This resulted in the grocer being sold out of the loaves that she provided him, and then through just word of mouth, the request just came pouring in. With such a big workload that she now took on, she had to find ways to produce bread on a mass scale. Margaret only had a high school diploma and was trained in bookkeeping at a firm that she eventually left to take care of her family for about nine years, but that didn't stop her. She wasn't focused on what she didn't know because she had enough desire to figure it out. Along with not knowing how to bake bread, she also didn't have experience in manufacturing or marketing or pricing, but she eventually worked that out. She didn't need some sort of institutional education to give her the confidence that she could do it. It's just enough desire to do something. All that's needed is enough desire to do something and it can be done because it's going to drive you to find out how to do it. To discover the information and get started and that's what Margaret did. Let's not let the lack of experience or not knowing how to do something prevent us from pursuing what we want. We've all been conditioned to see credentials that somebody has to prove their worthiness. And this is understandable for certain occupation, such as being a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist or working in finances, because these people affect lives in a very impactful way. But that shouldn't be the determining factor in wanting to get started. You don't need to go to business school to start a business. It's going to be helpful, but it's not the factor that's going to determine whether you're going to do well or not. Lack of knowledge should not be a deterrent. Now, if you lack that desire and the commitment to it, then that's a completely different story because things aren't just going to be handed to us. We got to go out there and make it happen. And that involves being disappointed, falling flat on our faces, and just failing over and over again, but figuring out how to get it done to overcome the struggles and the setbacks that we're facing. So as Pepperidge Farm grew, Margaret sought out help and she found the miller to stone grind the whole wheat and soon her kitchen could no longer keep up with the demand. So she moved it to her garage. Then in 1940, she opened up her first real factory. So for the first four years of her business, she could run it out of her home and it shows the importance of being able to handle the demand that you have because growing too quickly can be overwhelming as there's a lot of moving parts that need to be synced up correctly. Margaret was such a pioneer and she helped to bring about the access to healthy foods. She understood the value that she brought 
and that things being wholesome and good for people, that there should be a premium on the products that she made, but knowing that it was well worth it. Are people willing to compromise paying less at the expense of their health? I'm sure she's grappled with that question that has fueled part of what she was committed to. Eventually, she expanded beyond that first bread recipe. Pepperidge Farm eventually made more than 50 products by 1960. And during this time, their products were sold through 500 distributors and 50,000 stores across the U.S. And they had revenues of $32 million a year, which is extremely impressive for, for anybody, really. This huge success eventually resulted in the company being sold to Campbell's Soup in January of 1961 for about $28.2 million worth of Campbell stock. But Margaret continued to run Pepperidge Farm as its own subsidiary of Campbell. She was elected to the Campbell's board of directors and was the first woman to do so. She was a very hands-on leader that personally designed manufacturing setups as she knew exactly how the bakery equipment would be situated to support the most efficient and effective ways to process their products. Margaret is just such a great example of exceptional leadership where she gave a lot of opportunities to women and in fact many of the people that worked in her factories were women and this was in the time of the 1930s to the 1960s that women really didn't work let alone be in leadership positions but she really paved the way and is a great example to many other powerful women. You know many times those barriers that are seen are simply a way to be intimidated to everyone that's on the outside to make them doubt themselves that they can't do things. Being excluded does give a bit of not feeling worthy enough, but know that we are enough, that we are capable if we're willing to break down those barriers. It's helpful to see others who look like us, whether it's young girls looking up to powerful women, whether it's brown people looking up to other brown people who've had a lot of success. It gives that example of it can be done. But even if there isn't somebody that looks like you, yet you admire them and what they've done, you can do the same, that you can forge your own path. We don't have to look like everybody else to know that we can do what we really want. It's just important to really build yourself up to be empowered through your self-talk, your behaviors, and your actions. There were so many different challenges that Margaret faced and her husband suffering financial setbacks as a stockbroker because of the 1929 stock market crash. This compounded things that they lived off the farm to get by during the Great Depression. And through the challenges that they faced, especially with managing their youngest son's health, emerged an opportunity. She could have been content with just finding a recipe that fit her son's needs. Margaret didn't let her lack of experience and not knowing prevent her from forging ahead. You know, at the age of 40 is when she started baking bread. And it shows that we can start creating or pursuing the life that we want. She was able to distinguish herself from all the other cheaper bread products by providing high quality ingredients that were delicious. Just think of all the other products that Pepperidge Farm has, which now includes cookies like Milano and crackers like Goldfish and desserts such as puff pastry shells through being innovative and just being forward looking allowed them to just keep expanding beyond just bread this provides a sense of excitement of embracing change and in fact it really leads the way she was very much ahead of a lot of things at the time many of her competitors were focused on providing large volumes of bread at really low prices she was the opposite providing high quality products and lower volumes compared to others. Her commitment to quality meant saying no to cutting corners such as cost savings in the factories, staying away from automating equipment to knead the dough because she realized that part of what made the bread so good was the lightness provided by the hands that did the work, that people provide that gentle touch. And this is just such a great example of integrity and being committed to doing the right things. In a world where we can get that instant satisfaction, it's tempting to want to go for the fast things, for those things that reward us really quickly. But that compromises what makes us unique. 
what makes us value ourselves well. Be able to trust yourself even when others are pressuring you to follow them. A great example was during World War II, there was food rationing, and instead of Margaret lowering the quality of her bread, she simply limited production to maintain integrity of the ingredients. She understood the importance of upholding the reputation that she built. And throughout all these decades that Pepperidge Farm has been around, people know it's of high quality, that it's going to be well worth it, even though it comes at a higher cost. To have a standard and always stick by it, because the moment you start to cave in and live below it, what you've always worked towards is going to suffer. This is why it's important to grow into things that you're working So while we all would like to have success early on, and sometimes even in mass amounts, it can be too much to uphold over the long term. Being able to get acclimated to the success that you're experiencing is very beneficial because then you really come to grasp all the things involved. If we just look at some common things that might infatuate us, like a really large estate, and not just a house, but a big piece of property. Initially, it's very exciting that makes us feel like, wow, look what I've been afforded. But with that comes a lot more maintenance, so a bigger home means more upkeep to maintain, bigger piece of land means more work that needs to get done, more people involved, a higher cost to uphold. So that rapid amount of success or that rapid amount of feeling gratified, once that excitement wears off, It can feel daunting. And this is what makes Pepperidge Farm just so admirable that they've maintained the integrity and quality that people know when they buy their products, it's a high seal of approval and not just wanting to maximize the amount of money for the business. This commitment from the top trickled down into every part of their business. It was a wonderful place for many people to work and Margaret actually offered flexible working hours as she understood that people needed to take care of their homes and their family outside of work. Her being a working mother gave her a very insightful perspective to run an effective business. The things like how to buy things well and use food in the right manner to prevent waste, maintaining a clean home, having an effective routine and system allowed her to translate all that she learned at home on a small scale to a larger scale as the business grew. And women have a very unique relationship with their kids, especially during the time where she first started the business, which is in the 1930s, where the woman is more nurturing to the kids and the man would be the breadwinner and they take care of things outside of the home. So that special relationship she had with her kids was about catering to what fits them. And that's exactly what she did with her youngest child. Instead of her just saying, suck it up and deal with the health issues you have, she found something that worked for him. And I think she would use that same method for her employees. She wanted to find what worked best for them. Some women like working early in the morning. That way they had the rest of the day to do farm work or do whatever household chores that needed to get done. And then there's other women who like working in the afternoons. And this is a very proactive way of keeping people happy because without the right people, then no matter what business you have, it makes it very difficult to sustain success in the long run. It's just so impressive how she handled herself in every way from not knowing how to bake bread to how to be a salesperson, a marketer, running a business, all those moving parts. She probably faced things like self-doubt like we all do But that reason bigger than herself probably fueled a lot of that determination. Her initiative allowed her to just really go for things. And obviously, during the time, there was not too many other women that she could reference to. But it just shows that she was a very special person with strong characteristics to venture off and make it work. The lack of what she couldn't see was very beneficial thing because she didn't need to see how things are done, but just through her intangible things of bringing her ideas to life, allowed her to break free from what she was limited to. We all have limitations in the current state that we're in, but that shouldn't prevent us from breaking past it. 
maybe she had some sort of genes that made her a bit more courageous and mentally strong, but that also had to be further developed. Maybe her son being sick forced her to reach beyond what she knew. You know, the financial setbacks that they suffered as her husband worked on Wall Street during the Great Depression was really an opportunity for them to grow. Sometimes those big drawdowns makes us more resourceful to use what we have instead of get what we want. This just allows us to get back to the basics and not being so distracted by all the different things going on. Too often, the excuse is used of, I don't know how, or I don't know where to find what I need to get started. We all have hopes, dreams, and, and aspirations, but the difference between those that pursue them and those that don't is a strong enough desire to go for it, to go through the hard parts where they're experiencing the drought and can work through it to figure it out. Margaret Rudkin is just such an amazing person because of all those intrinsic things, all those fantastic traits that she had, all those things that's talked about on this podcast, such as grit and resiliency and overcoming failure, overcoming setbacks to just grow in whatever way you can. And while, yes, she made a large fortune, that wasn't her sole focus. It all started with just creating something to fit her son's needs. So if you need something that's not available out there, search for it or build it yourself. The easy thing to do is just buy what you need, whether you have the funds or not. But the rewarding thing is creating it yourself, making your idea or your vision come to life. Obviously, it's going to be very difficult and it can be very long with a lot of setbacks and heartbreaks, but being committed to it is going to make you a better person. It makes you more disciplined and accountable. That's going to serve you in whatever phase of life you're in. Through our hardships, we find out who we are and what we're willing to do to better ourselves. The more you act and find ways to overcome the challenges you're facing, you're probably going to find yourself in a lot better position because you're taking that proactive approach to seek change, to be better. For me, that's why I created Thriving Minds, a place where you can be yourself and grow into the person that best suits you, but at your own pace, because every place that I've been to, I've never fit in. Whether it's school or work, I felt that I've been the problem, only to find out that, no, the problem is restricting people and what makes them great. It can be so isolating, so frustrating in those environments that I've been because who I am is not what they want. I've constantly been constrained by being in those places for so long that I've kind of built up resentment towards not recognizing I needed to change things sooner, to find a place where I can be myself and thrive. And that place is here at Thriving Minds. No other place fits me. So I decided to create a place where I can fit in. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're interested in more topics like this, become a Thriving Minds member at www.thrivingminds.live. It's your personal development resource so you can build that right mindset so you can live to thrive. All right, until next time.